Okay, let's begin this morning. We'll start with prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, as we consider the history of the church and the history of its theology, we want to gain insight from some of the great students and pastors and scholars of the past. And as we briefly look at Luther's theology of the cross, we pray that we might indeed learn more about what it means to be the people of God, what the cross represents in terms of your power revealed in the world, and we pray that you would lead us and guide us in our study. We ask this through Christ. Amen. All right, this, this isn't designed to be, oh, sorry, Gene. Um, a 17 year study, uh, just 14 years. I have one handout left. Okay. I'll, I'll leave the logistics up to the rest of you at this point. This is a brief study on Martin Luther's theology of the cross, or the Theologia Crucis. And if you've, been, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, and you have not read at least one of the many, many Martin Luther biographies out there, then well, I don't have anything nice to say to you. you. You should read at least one. And while reading one won't gain you any merit before God, it should do at least three things for you. It will edify you as you learn more about the roots of your Protestant beliefs and faith especially before those uh, beliefs underwent so many dramatic changes in 19th century America. So we are the heirs of a 16th century movement that once it hit um, post-constitutional America underwent dramatic changes, some of which probably left us wondering what even a Protestant was. You'll also see, if you read a biography, how the Western church devolved into such a stagnant pool of corruption and worldly power, and how it insulated itself from any type of genuine reform in late medieval Europe. And, and this is like a bonus, you'll be entertained by a true-to-life adventure story with the stakes very high for those who were the protagonists in that story, particularly Luther, but it has all the stuff of you know, kind of medieval, late medieval uh, action and adventure. There are rival kings and kingdoms and people vying for authority and clashes of authority. Has scholarly debates, um, mostly carried out in Latin. There is martyrdom and the threat of martyrdom. And then there is a Hercules-like hero who is sort of rising to the top at this point. And as you can tell from Hans Holbein, The Younger's Woodcut, which is on the cover of your handout. And by the way, what I want you to do with these handouts is leave them on the floor after we're done and don't take them home or look them over or anything. Thank you. That's what usually happens to handouts. 
The church spent $12 to print these, so coming out of your pocket. So Luther was called the German Hercules by his admirers, and you get an idea of how that looked, complete with Luther's tonsure. You know what a tonsure is, right? No. Uh, the, no, those are tonsils. The tonsure is the monk's haircut, right? And it's a bald spot. So if you look closely, you'll see that Luther's bald on the top, but there's hair around the front. So this is not losing hair as men might do as they go older, grow older. It, is a, it signifies dedication to God and it was part of the monastic vow. So there he is in his monastic garb, complete with tonsure, and he is fighting and winning against a variety of opponents. Uh, we'll mention those in just a moment. But this woodcut that's on the cover, it's, it's one of many really cool woodcuts that are often reproduced in Luther biographies including some pretty vulgar ones, which open a window into, uh, not only into the age, but into the nasty religious debates of that time and that place. And I've actually visited a few YouTube uh, sites where staunch Catholics are treating Luther biographically, and there's still a real wellspring of hatred for Luther out there. It's sort of fun to engage that a little bit because he ruined the church from a Roman Catholic point of view. What's doubly interesting is I've also been looking at some Eastern Orthodox sites, and they don't like the Catholics any more than the Protestants do for a variety of reasons. And because Eastern Orthodoxy is so exotic to we Westerners, and we think almost exclusively in terms of Western Christianity with its 16th century schism, we forget that there is a significant representation of Christendom in the East. And they despise the doctrine of transubstantiation and they despise the Pope, and they despise, um, what was my third despise? Transubstantiation, the Pope, and oh yes, the filioque clause in the creed. So they're still miffed about that 1,000 years later, which what's interesting is you're entering into a whole different kind of Christianity that is serious about their Christianity. So they take their Christianity as seriously as Protestants would, but they have a different experience of it because of their age. They trace themselves back to the very earliest church. So I'm thinking in retirement of becoming in a Greek Orthodox priest, because then I can have a ponytail. They wear their hair long and beards. So you get to see all those cool woodcuts, including a couple of um, kind of vulgar ones. Scatological humor was one way of getting at your opponents in debate in those days. And the one you're looking at here, if you have the cover, this is according to the caption. The woodcut shows Luther strangling the Cologne Dominican and Inquisitor Jacob von Hoogstraten. Uh, so that's in Luther's left hand. He's strangling von Hoogstraten, or Straten, who sentenced the first Lutheran martyrs to death. But among the bodies scattered at his feet are Aristotle, Thomas Aquinas, William of Ockham, and Peter Lombard. So they represent the scholastics or the schoolmen 
and their philosophical father, who is Aristotle. Now, the woodcut is not only cool, it is relevant to the subject that we're going to consider. This is not a history of the Reformation. This is just uh, an analysis of Luther's theology of the cross. Um, but there is a key actor in this story that is represented in the woodcut. And it's not a person necessarily, but rather it is a method of study and argumentation. Does anyone know what that is? It's good to know this because it's still maintained in certainly Roman Catholic circles. It's scholasticism. Scholasticism. Um, I have a definition here by a German philosopher. It's not from a Christian source. Scholasticism is represented by the philosophical systems and speculative tendencies of various medieval Christian thinkers who, working against a background of fixed religious dogma, right? So there is already established doctrine. Using scholasticism, they sought to solve a new general philosophical problems as of faith and reason, will and intellect, realism and nominalism, and the provability of the existence of God. Initially, under the influence of the mystical and intuitional tradition of patristic philosophy, especially Augustinianism, and later that of Aristotle. Okay, so that's a mouthful, and I can, we can fill in some of what uh, Piper is saying there as we continue, but scholasticism is the method of study uh, and theological argumentation of the day, and I'm raising it because it can be considered a character in the story, and once we look at the theological, uh, the theology of the cross, you'll see that if you know that Luther is opposing scholasticism, his strange sounding arguments, some of which come off as almost nonsensical, make more sense. No, no, I, I mean, I suppose there's some overlap with what the uh, rabbis were trying to do with the Mishnah and then the Gomorrah, that's the Talmud. But think of scholasticism as a way of perceiving and describing truths. It's a method and it relies heavily on the Aristotelian foundation that was finally overthrown probably at the Enlightenment. So uh, Aristotle ruled the day for over a thousand years, well over a thousand years of church history. Um, so his way of interpreting reality, here's an example, the classic example of scholasticism and its relationship to Aristotle. It's the doctrine of transubstantiation. Okay, do you know what transubstantiation is? Right, it's the Catholic doctrine. It was a way to explain what actually happens in the Lord's Supper. So that when the priest uh, pronounces the words of institution, that blessing ceremony that is the high point of the mass, what's happening there? Jesus says, this is my body, this is my blood. At the Reformation, 
Zwingli and those who thought like him said, that, that's nonsense, it's only a symbol. So he basically means this will represent my body and will represent my blood. Luther doesn't like transubstanti transubstantiation at all, but he reverts back to a more classical doctrine of mystery. We can trust the words of Jesus that this is his body and his blood, but explaining it is impossible. It's like explaining the Trinity, right? Interestingly, and I just learned this recently, the Eastern Church is similar to Luther. They never tried to figure out what the Lord's Supper was. They just said, this is what he says, and we take that by faith. The Catholics, on the other hand, figured it out, and they used Aristotelian categories to do so. So, and I'm not an, I don't know all that much about Aristotle, so I don't want to pretend like I'm an authority on, you know, uh, pre-Christian philosophy or anything like that. I don't even like philosophy. I find it boring. But Aristotle makes a distinction within the world between substance and accidents. The word is spelled in English exactly like a car accident, an accident, okay? So substance is the essence of a thing. The accident is merely the appearance of a thing as uh, appropriated by the human senses, right? So transubstantiation means that the substance of bread and wine, whatever it is that is the essence of bread and wine, that becomes quite literally the body with its, the body and blood of Jesus and his two natures joined together in that union. So that now the, the essence of the bread and the wine is the, the literal body and the literal blood of Jesus. But the accidents don't change. So it still looks and feels and smells and tastes like bread and wine, okay? You all following that? Okay, so you need, you need Aristotelian categories to develop that theology and reach that conclusion, right? So the substance undergoes this miraculous change, the essence, even though it's still to all appearances, to the senses, bread and wine. That's, I would say that's a classic illustration of scholastic thinking. That's correct, it's not. It's, he is the one ordained to carry out that transformation. And it's by virtue of his office. That's where I have my problem with that. Mm, I have a few problems with it, but it, like, like you should always do in any conflict, argument, and I don't mean necessarily the, the actual face-to-face -face argument, but step into the worldview of the people making the argument and live there for a while so you can understand why they think the way they do. So if you presuppose scholastic thinking, then this is the natural outcome of it, right? So we come at it cold, we're not thinking scholastically, and we say, what do you mean by that? What is this substance, essence? versus accidents thing, but it makes sense in their world. And that's, we'll, we'll come back to that because as we're reading the theology of the cross, Luther has uh, scholasticism in his sights, okay? So I think I've read at least six Luther biographies 
including Martin Breck's three volume study, which is like that thick. Uh, it's about as exhaustive a study, I think, as there is on Luther's life. I'm not as well acquainted with the literature these days, but I know that you can't go wrong with Roland Bainton's Here I Stand. Uh, Bainton was a first class scholar of uh, the 16th century, uh, taught at Yale University. It was first published in 1950. Uh, when I I did a uh, Luther slash Reformation um, elective at Whitfield years ago, and I assigned this book, Bainton's Here I Stand. And I think, I think the kids read it, and I think it was very accessible. Um, Cara reminds me of the longer version of that elective, Luther and the Reformation, which I think covered 17 years of Sunday school classes, roughly. roughly. But it's still good. It, yeah, well, you know, nobody knows about the Reformation except the solas. And there's so much more to it than that. And it's an exciting story. And then I tacked on an appendix, a short biography of John Calvin. I'm going to suggest that you not choose Eric Metaxas' Luther biography because, because I don't like Eric Metaxas and I don't want him having the royalties. So check it out of the library if you want to. But he, he's been publishing views of church and state that are just abhorrent in my opinion. Oop. Excuse me. I don't have a Kleenex, so we'll have to. Uh, yeah, we. Tonight? Yeah. OK. Hot dogs in AFV, America's Funniest Videos. <laughs> um, so, but Roland Bainton, a guy named Kittleson, wrote a biography. I don't think it replaced Bainton's. I just read a, f a fine one by a woman named Lyndall Roper, who teaches in England, and I was so pleased with it that I actually wrote her a letter, and she responded to it, the le email. Um, so we're meeting for coffee next time I'm over in England. A very nicely written. British authors seem to have a gift of writing that American authors uh, don't seem to have, so I praised her for that, and uh, it's, it's, it's sympathetic to Luther, but it's not hagiographic. And so that's also a good one, but I would start with Bainton. If there was a church history prof here, he might have a better suggestion. So <clears throat> once again, if you have been a Christian for any length of time and have spent some or most of that time in self-consciously Protestant churches, then really you should know about the Reformation. And even if your knowledge of it isn't extensive, you, you must, I would think anyway, have an acquaintance with Martin Luther, the 95 Theses, does that ring a bell, right? Uh, his appearance at the Diet of Worms, Ring a bell? Yeah, who wants to have a diet of worms, right? That's for robins. And then the five solas, which of course we love. Sola Scriptura, which Roman Catholicism and Eastern Orthodoxy still hate. Solus Christus, Sola Fide, Sola Gratia, and Soli Deo Gloria. And then there was a an unnamed Italian reformer who tried to add a six, O Sola Mio, but it never got any traction. Thank you, thank you. So to set the scene, let's pick up the story in the most famous Reformation year, 1517, when on October 31st, Luther posted 
his theses, Disputation to Explain the Virtue of Indulgences. And they were written in Latin, uh, and they were the work of a sincere Roman Catholic academic, because Luther was a son of the church, and he was seeking public and scholarly debate, not about indulgences per se, but over their abuse. Um, in other words, at this point, though he's thinking and studying, his criticism of indulgences was based on a sincere medieval theology and piety. So not on the Protestant doctrine that he and then the Reformation became famous for. It's not as if what became Protestantism uh, was born as an adult, right? It, it evolved in the conflicts of the day. Absolutely. There's historical and there is even a regional dimension to it. And personal. and personal. That's right. That's what makes the story so fun. It's not just, you know, a bunch of theologians in a room arguing. It takes place at just about every level of society. And every level of society is in one way or another represented in the Reformation and in turn is affected by the Reformation, all the way down to the consolidation of a German language under the influence of Luther's German Bible. So. And that's not a criticism, it's, it's an observation. It's, oh. often, it's often, arguments are often dismissed out of hand because, well, that's just these factors. Right. And that, that discounts God's providence in the world who works through the ordinary means of decision making and cultural developments. You know, what's the biggest invention of the day that makes the Reformation possible? The printing press, right? So without these things, um, they would have come along eventually, but they came along at that time, so there was, and I hate to use this phrase, but the perfect storm where everything came together at once. So that's 1517. The next year, in April 1518, Luther was sent as a delegate to a meeting of Augustinian monks, and Luther was an Augustinian monk, uh, at the city of Heidelberg in Germany a journey, as Roper tells us, of nearly 250 miles as the crow flies. She goes on, many had advised Luther not to travel. He wrote to Johannes Lang, a friend, that he had been warned that preachers were condemning him from their pulpits and the people would try to burn him but he nonetheless insisted on walking all the way with a man named Leonard Baer, who was one of his students, and with a fellow named Urban, who was the monastery's messenger. It seems that at this juncture, Roper writes, he did not anticipate much popular support for his cause. And it is at this Heidelberg disputation that he defends, and this comes from Schaff's church history, theological paradoxes. Hold on to that phrase, because that phrase itself helps to explain uh, the odd thesis, or the odd uh, propositions that we're going to find in his theolo theology of the cross. He defends theological paradoxes drawn from Paul and from Augustine concerning natural depravity, the slavery of the will, regenerating grace, faith, and good works. He advocates the Theologia Crucis against, and this is his foil, the Theologia Gloria, and contrasts the law and the gospel. 
And perhaps more to the point, these theological paradoxes pose an open and direct challenge to the church's scholastic methodology. And this proves to be central to the Theologia Crucis. So every once in a while in a sermon, I even, it might be an offhand comment where I'll talk about Luther's theology of the cross. I think I did last week or the week before, or maybe both, and it occurred to me that people might not know what I'm talking about. Or you might think it's just, okay, a theology, a theology of the cross, apart from the, the fomenting conflict that is uh, about to boil over in Europe at the time. So they are theological paradoxes, as we'll see in just a moment. And Roper goes on to explain that just as no one can employ the evil of sexual desire properly unless they are married, so no one can philosophize well unless he is a fool. That's a paradox, right? No one can philosophize well unless he is a fool, that is, a Christian. He means that pagan philosophy cannot be the lens through which to interpret scripture. Luther here draws an interesting parallel, suggesting that sexual desire is no worse than any other human activity, while comparing the practice of philosophy with sensual indulgence, right? So if a man loves his wife, his desires for his wife are perfectly appropriate. But that desire that exists within him is not appropriate in any other context. It's not transferable to all sorts of other women, right? That's the analogy. You can't take what may be appropriate in this one context and use it in other contexts where it actually does not belong, and it's actually counterproductive. So, he says, philosophy must be tamed by a healthy Christian disrespect for reason. And now we're getting at the heart of the Theologia Crucis, and why I think it's so important. This was life-changing for me. Indeed, Luther would repeatedly refer to reason as the whore. I used to like to say that every once in a while at Whitfield, where Aristotle is read, and of course the, the uh, classic uh, great books from that period of time, every once in a while I'd just point out, remember Luther said Aristotle was a whore. So, you know, he's a nice looking whore. He's an attractive whore, but he's still a whore. And we can't allow him, of course unintentionally, to provide the interpretive lens for reading the scripture. So no one can philosophize well unless he is a fool. And who is the fool? The Christian. Well, in the event, there were six future reformers in Luther's Heidelberg audience, including the very impressed Dominican Martin Bucer, who would go on to lead the reform in Strasbourg. Now, I'm gonna recommend this article because it's a New Horizons article. It's not very long, but Carl Truman, who teaches at Grove City, wrote, I don't, I can't, let me see if I have the date. No, I don't, I just have the, uh, wrote an article called Luther's Theology of the Cross and take true man, that's how he spells his name, like true man, Luther's Theology of the Cross and you'll come right to it in New Horizons. And he said this about Bucer. Bucer would end his days as professor of divinity at Cambridge. He was a man of vast intellect and wide ecumenical vision. Bucer was to have a profound influence on a generation of reformers, not least John Calvin. 
and his first taste of Reformation thinking was provided by Luther at Heidelberg in 1517. Sick. It was actually 1518. The editor must have missed that. So, this is the broader context in which Luther worked out his Theologia Crucis. Now let's walk through the 28 theses to get an overall feel for Luther's theology at this point, especially the theological paradoxes, right? Um, there were more than 28, but 28 of them were actually theological. Others were philosophical and political. Once we've done this, I'm just going to read them. We'll look more closely at the ones that I pick out for more attention, a closer look. So this is spring 1518. All of this is an intra-church argument. Luther is not the reformer yet. Okay, So he goes to Heidelberg, and this is what is to be argued. The law of God, the most salutary doctrine of life, cannot advance man on his way to righteousness, but rather hinders him. Much less can human works, which are done over and over again with the aid of natural precepts, so to speak, lead to that end. Although the works of man always appear attractive and good, they are nevertheless likely to be mortal sins. Although the works of God always seem unattractive and appear evil, they are nevertheless really eternal merits. The works of men are thus not mortal sins, we speak of works that, are appar that apparently are good, as though they were crimes. The works of God, though he does through man, are thus not merits, as though they were sinless. The works of the righteous would be mortal sins if they would not be feared as mortal sins by the righteous themselves out of pious fear of God. By so much more are the works of man mortal sins when they are done without fear and in an, in an unadulterated evil self-security. If, don't worry if these don't make sense, that's fine. Um, at least you get a feel for the paradox and we'll go over some that stand out later. To say that works without Christ are dead but not mortal appears to constitute a perilous surrender of the fear of God. Indeed, it is very difficult to see how a work can be dead and at the same time not, uh, not a harmful and mortal sin. Arrogance cannot be avoided or true hope be present unless the judgment of condemnation is feared in every work. In the sight of God, sins are then truly venial when they are feared by men to be mortal. Now, this language is Roman Catholic language, right? You can tell venial, mortal, works that are dead, and so forth. Free will after the fall exists in name only, and as long as it does what it is able to do, it commits a mortal sin. That phrase, as long as it does what it is able to do, is a direct reference to the theology of Gabriel Beale, and we'll get back to that as well. Um, Free will, after the fall, has power to do good only in a passive capacity, but it can do no evil at an active capacity. Nor could the free will endure in a state of innocence, much less do good in an active capacity, but only in a passive capacity. The person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him Right, that's very similar to as long as it does what it is able to do. This is Beale's theology, uh, the Via Moderna. 
um, a man does what lies within him and then God meets him at that point. So you go so far uh, with your own effort and then God sort of picks up the, the rest, right? You pay off as much of the debt as you can and then God has the resources to cover the rest. So a man, a person does what is in him but the person who believes that he can obtain grace by doing what is in him adds sin to sin so that he becomes doubly guilty. Nor does speaking in this manner give cause for despair, but for arousing the desire to humble oneself and seek the grace of Christ. It is certain that man must utterly despair of his own ability before he is prepared to receive the grace of Christ. That person does not deserve to be called a theologian who looks upon the invisible things of God as though they were clearly perceptible in those things that have happened. There's a lot of people who could learn from that one, by the way. He deserves to be called a theologian, however, who comprehends the visible and manifest things of God seen through suffering and the cross. That's that's one we'll come back to for sure. A theologian of glory calls evil good and good evil. A theologian of the cross calls the thing what it is. That wisdom that sees the invisible things of God in works as perceived by man is completely puffed up, blinded, and hardened. The law brings the wrath of God, kills, reviles, accuses, judges, and condemns everything that is not in Christ. Yet that wisdom is not of, it is not of itself evil, nor is the law to be evaded. But without the theology of the cross, man misuses the best in the worst manner. He is not righteous who does much, but he who, without work, believes much in Christ. The law says, do this, and it is never done. Grace says, believe in this, and everything is already done. One should call the work of Christ an acting work, and our work an accomplished work, and thus an accomplished work pleasing to God by the grace of the acting work. The love of God does not find, but creates what is pleasing to it. The love of man comes into being through what is pleasing to it. And if any one of these interests you particularly, you can at least let me know, because we're not going to go through all of them, but I'm going to pick out the ones I want to talk about, but I'll pay attention in case you have one that you want to talk about. Okay, so drop these on the floor, half open, so people can walk over them and then you won't get another one. Any questions before we close? This is, this is an insight that hasn't resonated in the larger Protestant community as much as the more familiar ones. Travis. Why wait till retirement for? Oh, well, yeah. Years and years ago, I asked the session, this goes back to the early 2000s, if I could grow a ponytail, and they said they didn't want me to grow a ponytail. I don't know, maybe, I have new uh, members of the session, maybe George and Doug and I can discuss it. Big, big yeah. They do it kind of, it's cool, they always, get it back, you know, and, um, right, I don't think I can do it. And Marsha doesn't like it, so. I know, she reminds me. Yeah. All right, then, let's prepare for worship. <laughs>